In this episode, after two years, we invite back the fabulous Lindy Cohen, the nude nutritionist, cutting through the BS in the wellness world. She calls it wellness wankery. So in this episode, we'll be diving into what are the food rules that you really need to worry about? What food myths or nutrition myths are creating unnecessary anxiety, keeping you stuck in an unhealthy relationship with food, with your body? You're going to really enjoy the way we break it down. Both of us train nutritionists. It should be very interesting to hear how confidently we talk about this because so many people out there have unnecessary food rules and fear around food. So I hope you enjoy that part. And Towards the end, we also discuss Lindy's transition into motherhood and how that might have played into her views around body image and the way that her life has changed and identity has shifted as she has become a mum. It's such a beautiful episode, really refreshing to hear in the wellness nutrition world. So you guys are going to love it. Okay, let's go to the show. Welcome back to the show, Lindy Cohen. I'm so, so excited to chat with you. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It has been almost two years since you were last on the Anxiety Reset podcast. And oh my God, it doesn't feel like it, does it? No, that's wild. I can't believe it's been two years. Uh, A lot's happened. A lot has happened. You've been through some big life transitions, becoming a mum. Had a baby and uh, got a dog and did a whole bunch of stuff. And yeah, it's been a bit of an identity crisis, but I've, I've come a long way, learned a lot. And that I think is definitely something so many women go through, um, that change of like, who am I now? I'm, I've got this like other being in my life. And um, I'd love to ask you a little bit more about that. But for this episode, Lindy, I was really thinking it could be so beneficial to dive into that idea of what are the food rules that we need to worry about? Do we need to worry about food rules? Are there some myths in nutrition that are keeping people feeling anxious and stuck in their relationship with food and or and being really self-critical too? Because that's what happens. We go, oh, I didn't tick off all the things or I missed this one or I, did, I, I, I failed here or I've been bad today. So I really want to cut through all of that BS that goes through our heads. And I love how, how that is just like, you're the perfect person to speak to about that. <laughs> yeah, you're speaking my language right now. I'm kind of calling out wellness wankery is kind of what I do. It's part of my job description. And this is yeah. such a good topic because we are inundated with noise around nutrition. We know that there's more information around nutrition than there's ever been. And for many of us, we've grown up in a world where we've been bombarded with nutrition and food rules from as early as we can remember. It might be things like, oh, you have to finish everything on your plate, especially if you grew up with parents who um, were maybe struggling for money or came from war times or had a bit of trauma. Or to rules like you you can't have carbohydrates after a certain time of the day. There were the fat phobic years and there was the sugar phobic years. And honestly, it's 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 a lot for us to try to simply turn up and eat food without feeling stressed about it. Yeah, without feeling like the food's the enemy and we're sort of in some kind of battle with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and for me, that was how, how it was for so long. Um, But I I think this is something I'm always hearing from people. uh, So many questions around food and not knowing exactly what we should be eating. And that is, you know, something we don't need in our lives. So, well, maybe, Lindy, a good place to start might be what is the right diet for everyone? Is there a perfect (laughs) diet? I remember being like 18, 19 years old and desperately trying to research this and find out what the right one is and Mm. trying out different ones. Where are we at with that? What's the right way to eat? What a relief it would be if I could send you a meal plan that's just going to tell you what to eat, when to eat it. It's going to be perfect for your life. Sadly, my friends, it doesn't exist. That's not that. That's not something that that we can do. And the perfectionist in us, we want to be able to do that. We want to strive to get the perfect diet. Um, what's going to be healthy for me is going to be different for you and even if you know you eat the exact same diet as someone who has this you know so-called dream body it's not like you're actually going to end up looking like that person and at some point we do need to realize that 
I've seen people who thrive off you know, eating a higher amount of carbohydrates. Some people can't handle too much fiber. Some people need lots of fiber. And finding your perfect diet is not about tuning into what everyone else is doing or watching those totally curated day on a plate videos on TikTok oh, or Instagram. Yeah. But rather, it's about tuning into your body. And if you want to get curious about what the, the perfect diet is for you, your body's constantly trying to help you, give you clues about how to take care of it. So anything from your hunger and your appetite is going to help your body learn about when's the right time to be fueling your body with energy? How much fuel do you need at any time? We have an inbuilt mechanism for helping us do that. So we don't actually need to consult experts on how many calories we need when our body is constantly giving us that information. And of course, we know that when we're eating a diet that feels good for us, things just flow really nicely. So while some person might go, I don't feel so great when I eat these foods, for someone else it's going to be great. And I, I think one of the tricks we have, one of the problems we have is that we, we do look at other people's diets and we try and replicate it um, with, without listening to our own bodies. And that's kind of like the key, the key here. I honestly think growing up, we were just inundated with magazine headlines saying, you know, what does... Um, Oh, you know, this celebrity eat in a day and, and get her body if you eat. It's just such a ridiculous concept. Yeah, especially if you grew up in the 90s where, mm -hmm. you know, size zero was, was a thing where we thought Bridget Jones was supposedly meant to be a chubby girl. I don't know if you look back at photos. You know, like how did that get thrown our way? I have no idea. Totally. So especially if you grew up in the 90s, you were inundated with diet culture and it was, it was pretty intense. Yeah. And I think there's also then that feeds into looking in the mirror and it's like whatever you don't like about your body, that's sort of your fault maybe because you, of what you're eating. If you ate, you know, a certain way like a, a so-called supermodel eats, which is not very much, not very happy life, um, then in some cases, yeah, it's almost like you failed. It's a personal failure. And if you just tried harder, you would look like that. Mm, exactly. And I think we think that accepting our body is about reaching a certain goal weight, mm. but it's really not. So take a moment and think about a time where maybe you found an old photo of yourself where you're like, I looked so good. And yet when you think back to the time when that photo was taken, the high chance that you had spent that day going, I hate how I look. You may have felt uncomfortable in your body or wish that something could have changed. We have this idea that if I reach this goal weight, I'm suddenly going to be happier. But body image has got nothing to do with the goal weight. And, and just like those models you just talked about, they're some of the world's most beautiful in the world and yet simultaneously amongst the most insecure. And so I think we have this idea that we're going to keep chasing this goal weight. But I don't know about you, but anytime I've reached a goal weight, the goalposts have just shift and I shifted and I've suddenly noticed new flaws about my body. Mm, exactly. And it just never changed. Like it never, you're never satisfied. That mind <laughs> will always find something to criticize about you. <laughs> yeah. It never ends. So we got, we got to decide that it has to end. We've got to decide that it's not your life's purpose to look perfect from every angle. And you've got to remind yourself of that when you have those bad body image days and the days when you wake up and you're going, I'm feeling fat. I've got nothing to wear because we all have those things. You can't live in this world where you're getting inundated with messages and photoshopped images and, and not feel like your body is wrong. You know, it was really heartening. One thing that has changed, I think it's been in the last year, maybe the last two years, where I remember growing up with Victoria's Secret models as like the epitome. And that was like the start of everyone's eating disorders, unfortunately, in high school, which is just so, so sad. And I think in the last year or so, they've completely dropped the Victoria's Secret traditional thing and gone for, I don't want to say like real bodies, but just more variation and a more healthier sort of image around what, what women can look like and be what beauty is, which I think is kind of cool. It's a step in the right direction. I think it's, I, I certainly is. I mean, I think for, for Victoria's Secret, it's a little bit, you know, too little, too late. Mm. But I, I feel like, you know, when, when big diets start pretending not to be diets, that's when you know that things are shifting, that even like the people who have been selling us before and after photos and weight loss and all these big promises, they're pretending they're not a diet. And I'm like, hey, this is big stuff. Things are changing.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think as well, um, I know, I, I know, I saw you post this beautiful thing. Well, it wasn't so beautiful. Um, it was, I don't know what show it's from, but Gigi Hadid and her mom was like, you know, telling her, darling, you've got to like, you can eat bad food today, but you know, it's just your one night because it's your birthday, but the rest of the time you've got to go back to your diet and you've got to count your calories if you want to look like that. And the comment you made, which I thought was beautiful, is like, it's, it's not, uh, thank God we're now moving to a place where most people would look at that language and be like, oh, something's wrong here. That's not cool. Whereas maybe 10, 20 years ago, that was completely acceptable in society. Yeah, absolutely. I do feel like, you know, all of us were kind of a little bit more skeptical about these things. We've, we've all kind of gone, we've tried the thing. We've, we've, you know, we really bought into it. We tried all the grimy diets and yet we realized they didn't work. So I feel like we're all kind of a little bit more on guard. Um, and picking up that disordered eating because so often in the health world, disordered eating is camouflaged as health advice and it's blurry lines. Like when does one start and the other one ends? Yes. So I like that. I think things are, things are changing. Yeah, definitely. Which is exciting. It's not all bad. So in the sense of counting calories, is there ever a time where it's appropriate or required or necessary for a healthy person to count calories? <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad you added the word healthy person because there are some times when, you know, you're on the extremes or you're really struggling to gain weight. You might want to be adding in a little bit of extra energy that, co- that can be a handful, handy thing. But for the majority of people, counting calories doesn't work. And if counting calories worked, wouldn't people have stopped dieting by now you know we really we really gave calorie counting a hot red hot go but over the long term it's simply not something that we actually want to do for the rest of our lives I don't know about anyone listening but for me when I got into calorie counting I became very ferociously obsessed with calories and how much I was allowed to eat and not allowed to eat and the new version of counting calories or counting points is counting macros. Mm. So every few years, what you're going to notice is we simply swap counting one thing for another thing. You know, about five years ago, we were counting grams of sugar. Now we're counting cumulative macros. So this whole idea is going to continue to shift in different forms throughout the rest of your life. And, And the key thing is that you can kind of identify that, okay, this is just calorie counting reimagined and you're, you're repackaging it up to try and be a healthy, balanced lifestyle, but it's not something I want to do for the rest of my life. And that's a key question. Whenever you get confronted with health advice, nutrition advice, and you're like, ah, oh, could I do this? The question to ask yourself is, can I do this for the rest of my life? Because do you really want to count calories for the rest of your life? I don't. I'm not interested in that. I've tried it. I could do it for a few weeks, a few months. I could be good, lose weight. But ultimately, when I stopped counting calories, I regained the weight, which is a very common cycle. So to answer the question, no, I really, I, I think that calorie counting does more harm than good. I think it makes us obsessed and anxious around food. It makes healthy eating harder because suddenly we get to a meal and we have all these competing thoughts running through our brain between how hungry am I what do I really feel like eating and then what am I allowed to eat it can lead us to do this thing where we go to family functions we catch up with friends over a drink and we pick the healthy low calorie option only to get home and end up eating everything in the kitchen because we were feeling deprived because we weren't giving our body the right amount of calories for what it needed So the counterpart to counting calories, the alternative, which is much healthier, much easier, and you don't need any to buy any fanjangle thing to be able to do it, is simply tuning into your body. As I said, like your appetite, constantly trying to teach you how many calories to eat each day. And it's immensely accurate. They've done some research and they found that listening to your body as an intuitive eating and eating according to your appetite can help you eat within 50 calories of how much your body actually needs. Now, if I work out how many calories I think you need, I'm going to be using a very outdated uh, algorithm, which is basically taking into consider your assumedly average amount of calories. It's We know there's a huge degree of inaccuracy. Now, let's say you are having a very stressful day, a very active day. You didn't sleep well. Um, you have your period. You um, are you know, going through different things in your life. The weather can impact on how many calories you, you burn each day, whether you're hungover. You have all these variables on how many calories you burn each day. So the idea that you should pick a number and eat that many calories per day, it just 
doesn't really make sense. This outdated idea of eat fewer calories, then you burn, doesn't actually work in practice. It's inaccurate, it's outdated, and our body's already got a better approach for it. I guess it's fundamentally ignoring the fact that we are human beings. We are like different on different days, especially as women when we show up differently. I mean, men too. I mean, men are going to have days when they don't sleep as much or they're exercising more, but women, when you factor in our cycle, I mean, we burn, we require more calories when we are on our period. There's a natural appetite increase before your period and a natural appetite decrease as you ovulate. So it all figures itself out in the end. And how You're not meant to eat the same amount of calories every single day. Yeah. And, you know, you might notice that you have those days where you're completely ravenous. And if you're stuck in that calorie obsession phase, you might go, well, I'm only allowed to eat a certain amount of food. But actually, on the days when you're ravenous, your body's burning more energy. And then you can have that peace of mind going, you know what? My body's telling me I need to eat a little bit more today. And then mm. there are going to be days where I'm not as hungry. And you ride that wave simultaneously. It's very liberating to think that way. Absolutely. I think not doing that perpetuates the myth of like, there's something wrong with me. There's always, I'm not, I'm not normal. I'm overeating or I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, there's something not right about the way my body works, but it's like to let go of that and trust your body knows feeds into so many other things of like trusting life and trusting that, you know, you're going to be okay at the end of the day, which is where so much of our anxiety comes from. Mm -hmm. I think I'm kind of mulling over this whole idea recently about perfectionism and how it plays into food. Mm. So I think perfectionism tells us that if we don't do something perfectly, it's not worth doing at all, right? <laughs> and when it comes to healthy eating, we think we have this idea of what healthy eating is meant to look like. And it's maybe 5 a.m. wake ups and crop tops and green juices and these perfect nourishing bowls and chia seeds and, and kale and whatnot. And so when we deviate from this perfect idea of what healthy eating is meant to be, we feel like we've screwed up. This might lead us to get in situations where, you know, we have some chocolates and we think, well, I may as well just finish the pack because tomorrow I can start fresh. I have a clean slate, which means tomorrow I can start being the perfectionist again. And the other thing that perfectionism does is it leads to procrastination, you know, because we've set such lofty goals, such high standards for ourselves, we end up completely paralyzed by the myriad of things that we have to achieve in order to tick all the boxes all the time. And I know this is stuff that you talk about all the time. The way it feels like for me is like we have too many tabs open in our brain. Yeah. It's like the computer freezes. It just can't can't handle so many rules and so many things to think about all the time as a result we end up doing nothing we then blame ourselves I'm the failure I have poor willpower I can't stick to healthy eating without recognizing that our perfectionism is deeply impacting our idea of what healthy is and what if we simply embraced a healthy enough approach you know we ditch this idea that we have to eat perfectly to be healthy that there isn't any room for um, a mix of foods that there isn't room for going out with your friends and partying and being a bit silly when in fact there is so much room for that and yeah. natural intuitive eaters who've never dieted they do this quite naturally if you have a friend who's um, a non-dieter you'd be really interested of course they're gonna they'll eat chocolate they'll do it relaxed and they won't stress about it it's not going to change how they think about themselves or what they eat the next day and I think there's something we can we can learn about that Absolutely. And it's on this same wavelength, which is why I will never do a post or a podcast episode around, you know, the 15 anti-anxiety foods you should be eating. Yeah. Because like that is so simplistic. There aren't anti-anxiety foods or there's no, you know, when that you see posts like that and people like these are the hormone balancing foods. I, I suppose sometimes there's more of more maybe behind like foods that have an impact on supporting your liver and can change in that way. But I don't, it's not as simple as that. Yeah, ironically, it's very anxiety inducing to read mm -hmm. lists like that, isn't that? Because then we're measuring it up ourselves up against them and am I eating enough of these foods? Or what it does is it leads us to only focusing on the allowed foods. So we have this idea of, okay, well, I'm only allowed to have these kind of perfect foods. We know that's correlated with things like developing orthorexia. But from gut health perspective, we means we keep our diet small and limited. And we know for good gut health, what we need is abundance and variety and constantly changing up your diet. 
So people will ask me, well, what's the healthiest fruit to eat? Well, there is no healthiest fruit. The best way to eat fruit is to constantly change up what kind of fruit you eat, depending on the season. So yes, while berries might be high in antioxidants, all fruit is good for you. And the best thing we can do for our gut health is constantly mix it up as the seasons change. So if you always go to the grocery shops and you buy the exact same fruits, not only is that boring, but you could amp it up a little bit, have a little bit more fun. And there's no such thing as, you know, fattening fruits. That's an, that's a huge myth. I've lost <laughs> a bust right now. Um, uh, you're allowed to eat all fruit. You don't have to limit yourself to half a banana. That's sad. Let's not play that game anymore. Let's go a little bit bigger and actually just, you know, I think when we're creating all these food rules and cutting out all these things we're not allowed to eat, we do get obsessed. So I like to talk about the idea of crowding in more of the stuff that you really enjoy eating. And for me, fruit, definitely one of those things. I couldn't agree more, Lindy. And I'm just thinking about the idea of eating half a banana. I don't think bananas were designed to be eaten in halves because how gross do they get? How gross does the other half get when you like have, you know, cut off half of it or, you know, just bitten off half of it. It turns brown. It's mushy. It's not as nice. Like they are are certainly not designed to be eaten in halves. Nature didn't intend it that way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think we need to we need to take our cue from the banana and <laughs> and, and, and I understand that there isn't one prescribed amount that you should be eating. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, okay, so let's talk about carbs. Is there mm. ever, you know, I think it used to be fats are evil and low fat is good. I feel like surely these days that message has gotten through to people that we don't need to be eating low fat and that's not necessarily the best. Um, that's not necessarily a healthier option. Low fat this, low fat that. If you read it on a, on a package, it's not the healthy thing. Although I still see it a lot. It's still there on those packaged foods. Oh yeah, I was gonna say. I think I, I'd like to think that it's it's eased out of our culture, but I don't think so. I think especially the like my parents' generation, um, boomers. They're they're a lot more. They still subscribe to no fat and they subscribe to no carbs. So for mm. them, the the foods that they are now allowed to eat have gotten so small and restrictive that it's harder than ever for them to actually sit down and decide what's allowed. All you can eat is a piece of chicken or some eggs, basically. <laughs> yeah maybe a handful of nuts, you know, that's yeah. it. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's very yeah. depressing and it's no way to live. And ironically, it causes a lot of anxiety around food, which we know isn't good for, which isn't good for us. So yeah, let's not do that. But you were talking about cutting out carbs, this idea yeah. that carbs are fattening. Yeah. Bad for us. And I mean, when I say this, it brings up, like, I'm just thinking about those little snippets of pop culture that gave us this nutrition information as we were growing up, like Mean Girls, when I can't remember the name of the Rachel. Gretchen. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gretchen Wiener. And she's like, does this, is this, a, is butter a carb? Or she's like, does this have carbs in it? Like the, whatever the bars she was eating. And so it's very much suddenly, you know, the brain goes, as you're watching this as an impressionable, impressionable young girl, as I was at the time, it was like, and you were, it's like, oh, should I be, what are carbs? Should I be worried about these? Like, I didn't even know what they were until I saw that movie. So then this idea of like carbs are evil or something we should all be watching if we want to be slim and healthy starts coming into the psyche. What do we think about carbs? Ah, carb phobia. I'm I'm over carb phobia. It's um, what it does is it it once again limits limits down our list of allowed foods so that we feel like oh, I'm actually not even allowed that many foods, and we you know, find it hard to eat out. It reduces our ability to get enough fiber in our diets, which we know is essential for gut health. We know people aren't eating enough legumes, not enough whole grains, and I think this is so. There's a huge contributor to this is our serious fear of carbohydrates. A big one for me is when I was growing up, Oprah was on, she was promoting not having carbs after a certain time of day. And that became quite a big thing. And I think from then onwards, it's, I don't think we've recovered from that carb phobia. I'd say even people who call out diet culture are still going to be victims of thinking that carbohydrates are bad, that there's a limit to how much carbohydrates I have. And to think that eating pasta is something that we shouldn't be doing. Now, when I think about carbohydrates, firstly, I think of them as really satisfying foods. I, when I'm sitting down to have something like a pasta, I am thinking about how can I add in more vegetables? And even if like last night I had pasta without any vegetables and it was really satisfying. I didn't go to bed at night going, oh, I can't believe I ate pasta. It was really bad. 
I was like, this was a delicious meal. And I woke up this morning and instead of trying to undo, you know, the so-called bad food that I didn't eat last night, you know what I'm saying? I simply woke up and I listened to my body. And I think the thing that we do is when we demonize perfectly healthy foods that we know are the basis of so many affordable, healthy meals, we, we limit ourselves so greatly. And I think we, we, we make healthy eating so much more challenging because we've demonized a whole bunch of foods that we really didn't need to. I can't tell you how many people who are scared to eat things like sushi who go, well, that's not a, that's not a healthy option. And, you know, in health, everything's relative, you know, <laughs> of course, you know, going for something like a poke bowl, you're going to get more veggies, but sushi is like a perfectly fine food to eat and feeling scared about it is something that I think is more detrimental to you than actually eating something like rice. Absolutely. And one thing that I love to think of too, is the way that carbohydrates support our bodies. If we're menstruating and ovulation, it tells our body it's safe. Like we've got enough energy. We're going to be okay. Sending that glucose to the brain uh, takes you out of that survival place of what if we don't have enough food, like that very basic survival instinct. And so when we think of it from an anxiety perspective, those carbs are helping to tell your body and your brain you're safe. It's Mm. okay. And food safety is a very crucial element. This idea that food is always allowed. So for me, my specialty is binge eating disorder. And one of the things that happens with binge eating is we feel like foods aren't allowed. There is no food safety. Mm -hmm. And so when we finally do get access to things like, um, you know, loaves of bread, bowls of cereal, we find we lose control around them because suddenly we have access to them. We're going to try and get as many of these foods into our body as we can right now while we have access before we think it's going to run out. So we need to create this environment that food is safe, food is plentiful for us to feel relaxed around food, to reduce emotional eating, reduce binge eating. And I think a handy phrase that I like to teach my clients about is, um, you know, anytime you want to eat this food, you are allowed. We have this idea like, well, I, you know, I've got to get it now because the diet starts again tomorrow. Those natural intuitive eaters, they're not thinking that way. They know that if I want to have another slice of bread, if I want to have a bowl of cereal, it's always allowed for me. Therefore, I don't need to just eat as much as I can right now because there is food safety and there's food trust. Absolutely. That sense that, hey, if you're trusting your body, it all balances out anyway. I I think that's so cool, that research you mentioned before where trusting your body will, it has a certain regular rhythm. It it just gives us that extra sense of that's that's a real thing. It's a measurable Mm -hmm. thing and it's really available to us. Your body's not just going to, you know, go haywire and and eat everything until you just die because you're so, (laughs) you know, like you just can't keep eating. You can't um, eat anymore. Georgie, that's, an, that's such a good point because I think it's such a genuine fear we have. Well, if I if I ditch all these fruit rules, like thinking carbs are bad for me, then I am just going to lose control around food. I won't be able to stop eating. I'm going to eat all these bad foods. My weight is going to spiral out of control, which is the thing I fear the most. And interesting, what ends up happening is the opposite. When we have trust and safety around food, we can actually relax we find that we're not preoccupied by foods which means we don't seek them out and binge eat on them and uh, you know I think we think well I'll just eat you know my favorite foods in abundance actually that's not what happens they've done some really interesting research where I'll paint the picture for you they gave the participants macaroni and cheese a very delicious yummy food right and they gave them the macaroni cheese and then they gave them more macaroni and cheese the next day and the next day. And they measured how much participants ate. And what they found is when you have something that's highly palatable, that's delicious and maybe feels like a little bit forbidden, people tended to eat quite a bit of macaroni and cheese on the first day. But as the study goes on, you realize these people go, you know, I know there's more macaroni and cheese. It's coming. It's a bit, you know, I, I know I'm going to get more tomorrow. Therefore, I am going to be able to eat according to my hunger right now. And progressively through the study, they eat less and less macaroni and cheese until they get into a point where they're actually just eating the right amount for their body. Mm -hmm. So when we're coming out of this phase of diet world where we've had all these restrictions, there might be a period of time where you do start eating these previously forbidden foods and you go, oh my goodness, can't wait to eat you. But trust. Lost an earphone there. (laughs) We're back. We're back. (laughs) But as you continue to trust that these foods are allowed, 
and you start to relax around them. And then, and then you do get to a point where actually you don't want to eat macaroni and cheese all the time. That it's a bit like when you go away on holiday and you're just eating, you know, at restaurants for weeks on end and you just can't wait to have home cooked meals and fresh leafy stuff. And it's like, you get this intense craving for it. Yeah. So you don't have to worry that your body's just going to go berserk and only eat junk food. That's not actually what ends up happening. When we remove those rules, we realize that our body does have cravings for healthy foods and less healthy foods. And it actually really enjoys balance. Definitely. You know, I, one of my little things that I like to do of late is, and this is a little bit of that wellness culture, but using it in a beneficial way. So I love to start my day with a cacao with like coconut milk and almond milk. And it's that chocolatey rich goodness. And it is so delicious. And basically I'm starting my day with chocolate and that chocolatey flavor and taste Every single day I add some some sea salt, add my favorite protein powder to it. It's so thick and creamy. And it's like the idea that chocolate is a taboo food just doesn't even, it's not even in my brain anymore because it's literally something I have every single day in some form. And so it's really cool to kind of find things like that, that it, it's just, I feel so free to have chocolate like and when you know other chocolates are presented in front of me I I will have them but it's never like oh my gosh I have to have a whole handful of this I have to eat half the half the block you know yeah the whole block yeah for sure (laughs) and if you're finding that 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 you are when you do finally get access to something like chocolate or your favorite food um, peanut butter out of the jar you feel like you can't stop that might be a clue that you need to do what you're doing is find ways to normalize it and bring it into your life in a way that just makes it like that, like the macaroni and cheese, it just becomes another food. Yeah. For me, my equivalent of that is like, I'm a big, I'm a big chocolate fan. And I, I, I do not want to live life without chocolate. So every morning on my cappuccino, I have flaked real chocolate on my cappuccino and it is awesome and delicious. And likewise, you know, sometimes I'll sit down to have some chocolate and I could have one block or I could have like two rows. It's okay. Depends on the day, depends on my hormones and what's happening. But because I know it's always there, I'm allowed to eat it. So I think we have a lot of confusion around chocolate as well. It's this weird food where people go, oh, it's rich in antioxidants. Oh, it's really got too much sugar in it. Oh, it's good for you. Oh, it's bad for you. And we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. what's the truth? So I think it's a good question to, to talk about. And how does your body feel about it? And all I know is chocolate. I feel good about it. I feel great about it. I love thinking about all the, you know, magnesium and minerals in it. And I'm just like, this is, this is awesome. I get to have something rich and delicious every day that it just makes me feel so satisfied and and fulfilled in that way. But let's touch on sugar and particularly in Australia, although I believe it was a real international thing, the I Quit Sugar movement. Now, I love Sarah Wilson. She's been on the show. She's phenomenal. We love her so much. However, that whole movement, I believe, really fueled a sense of this anti-sugar idea, like 100% no sugar. And, you know, people were starting to link sugar with If you have this sugar, you're going to get cancer. If you have this sugar, you're going to develop, you know, all sorts of diseases and issues and inflammation in your body. And while there is an element of truth in the right context to some of those claims, that anxious mind can grab onto that information and just be like, oh, my God, I'm going to die if I have this stuff. Where do you sit with the idea of sugar, Lindy? Well, I think it's you raised such a good point because I think anytime we're getting a diet that's telling us to cancel and cut out an entire mm. food group, it should send alarm bells ringing in your brain because you know previously it was fat, then it was carbohydrates. I quit sugar, made sugar now a forbidden thing that we had to go completely extreme on. And mm. I think the tricky thing, as you touched on, is that there were elements of truth to it. So um, instead of going seeing the balanced picture of it all, we thought, well, let's just cut it out completely. And I think that that can cause so much more anxiety to feel stressed out because sugar is in so many foods. Yeah. And I think that, I I really think that 
abandoning all sugar is a big mistake because you'd be having to cut out so many really nutritious foods. You'd be limiting your diet. You'd be making socializing and eating out and eating healthy actually so much more challenging. And I actually think from an anxiety perspective, it could be quite isolating to put yourself on quite an extreme and, you know, divergent diet. Yeah. Now, do we tend to have too much sugar in our diet? We know we do, right? But I think telling ourselves that we're not allowed to eat sugar is a surefire way to eat more sugar. So instead of quitting sugar, which is only going to make you obsessed with the thing that you cannot eat, try crowding in more of the healthy stuff, the stuff you want to do. And go, you know, I still get to have my chocolate. I still get to have my ice cream and the yummy things that I enjoy, the things that honestly make my life really enjoyable. But I am going to crowd in more of this stuff, like the whole grains and fruits and vegetables. And naturally, what you're going to find is you feel better, you feel good, and you didn't have to take it to the extreme measures. You know, we know that with the research that for our mood, for, for depression, for, uh, for anxiety, there is a bilateral, bidirectional relationship between mood and food, right? So um, what that basically means is if you, if you eat healthily, your, your mood may feel better. And um, if you feel better, you, you, you might eat a healthier diet. It kind of works both ways. Um, but, but basically, I think that we just need to be thinking about how can we be a little bit more balanced and not take things to extreme so we're not aggravating our mood disorders, but at the same time trying to be healthier. 100%. I think one of the little like thorns in my side is when people say, oh, but there's still sugar in kombucha. So you shouldn't have it. It's not actually very <laughs> healthy at all. And it's like, well, if there is any sugar in kombucha, because it's added so that the, the bacteria can ferment and they have to eat the sugar to create the bubbles that you get in, in kombucha. But uh, even if there is some residue sugar in it, if you're swapping that out for your regular Coke or soft drink, you, it's so much, um, so, so, so much less sugar and so much better for you. And I still think you get like most of the enjoyment of a soft drink, having something like a kombucha instead. Totally. I fully agree. And that, that goes back to the point of this demonizing of foods that are perfectly fine. Mm. And, and this idea of perfect eating, perfect eating would be having right water every time you have a drink. That's not always going to happen. So having those things that are still pretty perfect, let's be honest. Um, but they don't need to tick every single box in order that for them to be worthy and deserving in your diet. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so I think we've cleared up sugar and it's okay to have a little bit of sugar here or there. Um, and not, yeah, just even even have tons of sugar one day. Your body will sort you out because if you don't feel good having that all that sugar in your system, you won't want to create that every day. Your body's not going to crave that every day. For sure. I think there's a lot of guilt. It's coming up to Easter time as we record this. And I think there's so much guilt around things like Easter time and how it's going to destroy your diet and people feeling really guilty after eating lots of chocolate on Easter. And I will always say this, you know, one day or one week of not eating that healthily isn't going to destroy your diet. Just in the same way that if you have a putted of blueberries, it's not going to transform your health. You know, what we're looking at is the big picture stuff. So I think we can get quite attached to, well, I really screwed up there and oh my, I have to start from scratch. You're not, start, you're not starting from scratch. You already have a really good base. Let's just build from there, not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so I think we can kind of alleviate a lot of the anxiety we have around food if we're just not going um, and thinking that, you know, that you're not allowed to have those, I guess we'll call it a blowout, days where you're just like, whoa, whatever, it all happens. You yeah. have to earn it back by exercising. And I particularly hate during Easter time how they have those, you know, if you ate three eggs, do this many burpees or, you know, what an awful way to create a, a negative relationship with food and with exercise. And um, exercise is not about earning food. It's about doing things that your body, making yourself feel good. And on that topic, I've recently started doing these mental health morning walks and I'm a little bit loving it and I just need to do it for my mental health every day so attaching it to calories and food is a really great way to ruin exercise for yourself so I would not recommend yes a hundred percent yeah I love that you brought up Easter time because it's totally I was just reflecting as you were saying that how it used to be so different for me. It used to be like a big, I have to get all the chocolate in I possibly can today and maybe Easter Monday. And then that's it because they're the days I can have it. Whereas now I'm like, 
it's such a non thing. Like I'll just have my chocolate that I want to have. And it's so much permission there that I just don't stuff my face. Like, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. isn't that, isn't that right? And then you know that, well, the day, you know, the Tuesday after Easter, if you want to eat chocolate, you can go eat chocolate. And, and knowing that, that they've food trust, that that's the thing that allows you to do that. Yeah. Um, So if you are currently, dreading Easter or it's past Easter when you're listening to this and you're feeling really guilty about it, please don't. But just maybe there's a clue in this that we need to try normalize foods like chocolate again. And the answer isn't to take, you know, to restrict chocolate and avoid it. But maybe the answer is to include more chocolate in your diet in a way that feels balanced and healthy and normal for you. So when I was learning how to do this, maybe I would go to a cafe and I'd order Nutella on toast. Or I'd go out with girlfriends and I'd have you know, Maltesers at the movies, those kinds of things where instead of me crouched in a cupboard ferociously eating as much chocolate because tomorrow my diet started, I was thinking of ways that how can I make it a social aspect and help my body realize that chocolate, you know, Easter eggs, none of it's going off limits. Um, yeah. Although you can't really get them year round, but most of the year you can buy Easter eggs. <laughs> and those hot cross buns. Oh my gosh. So mm. And it's, yeah, it's letting that be so normal to have these foods on that regular basis. Um, Just, you know, almost like a little reminder, a little check-in every now and then. Hey, this is all cool. Just like, just have a little bit, have some, enjoy it. Um, On on that note, Lindy, gluten. (laughs) Let's talk about gluten. Gluten had to come up, really. So your gluten was very much demonized for many years and I think it still is Mm -hmm. and we have this idea that a gluten-free diet is synonymous with health and what ends up happening is we arbitrarily cut it out of our diets because we follow these days in the place and what the celebrities they don't eat good and therefore I shouldn't eat gluten and we once again we're, we're whittling down the list of allowed foods making it hard for us to eat healthily but at the same time a lot of gluten-free foods are actually less healthy for us so if you're kind of trying to find those alternatives they do tend to have gluten's binding ability is what makes it so fantastic with food so if you take out the thing that binds food together in food science you tend to have to add in more sugar and more fat you have to reduce things like fiber typically to try and make the food stick together so when you get a gluten-free product that's typically what you're going to find tends to be a less healthy comparison um and at the same time there there are tons of people who are going to who are going to benefit from having a lower gluten diet. And of course we have celiacs and those with sensitivities. Um, But I think something we can talk about is this idea of gluten load that people aren't probably familiar with. We think Mm -hmm. of of it as either all or nothing. You can eat gluten or you can't eat gluten. But okay, for example, last night, we know I ate ate pasta. Um, Pasta, it was a big bowl of pasta. So afterwards I felt bloated. Does that mean that I can't eat gluten? No, it does mean that I in my usual diet, that was a high gluten load meal. So it kind Mm. of got my gut a little bit out of surprise. So when you're going, okay, well, I ate this meal, it must mean that I need to cut out all gluten. Well, just think about how much you ate or what you ate the entire day. Maybe it was just a high gluten day. Does that mean you need to just eliminate it? No, it might mean that you got to go, okay, it was just a bit of gluten in one day and let's just find a little bit more balance when that is concerned. So I think in nutrition, we have this temptation to just go all or nothing. We need to avoid that temptation. Totally. And imagining too, like if you were say out at a restaurant and that was combined with a few glasses of wine and other things that are playing into making you not feel so good, it could totally make you think it's the gluten's fault and just 100% gluten. (laughs) Totally. And, you know, let's talk about the kind of um, IBS and IBD kind of symptoms. Um, I think there's a lot of people who inappropriately think that they are gluten free when, okay, let's say during your period, we know that you get fluctuating changes in your bowels. So you might have diarrhea before you get your period, you might get constipated. I think there's a lot of people who kind of go, or, you know, we know you get bloated. So I think there's a bunch of people that go, well, every two weeks, I have these kind of unexplained symptoms which they haven't quite put together the link and then they go well I, it must be gluten or it must be dairy or something and they cut it out yeah. or they have something like all right we're going to have um, a stir fry and they think oh well it must have been the rice the rice made me feel, feel so bloated 
which by the way doesn't have gluten, but um, it, it very much could be onion and garlic and something like a stir fry. Yeah. And, you know, and I think we when we we get a little bit like we think there's a villain in food, and so we we accidentally cut things out and making our lives harder than they need to be. And if you are kind of going, all right, I'm struggling with some like gut symptoms, then of course speak to someone who specializes in that area to try and work out what is actually going on instead of just gambling with it and cutting out all these foods. We are so quick to say it must be the food and I've got to like start eliminating. Now I, I've got to take out strawberries and see if that helps and then take out like all these random little things. And most of the time, if you're reacting to all these different foods, it's not so much the food. That's actually a clue that there's something in your system handling food in general that's just that's changing whether it is your fluctuating hormones or something to do with your gut health something going on like that stress you know stress right anxiety (laughs) (laughs) yeah and then and then and then cutting out those foods causes more stress more anxiety we're actually perpetuating the problem yeah 100 percent. okay last myth i really want to get clear on here for people bmi (laughs) Fun one. Okay. Do you have right. a high BMI or what, is, what does that mean? Does that mean you're an unhealthy person? Hun- like- yeah. So BMI is a, it was developed by a, a stat- statistician and basically he was looking at the whole populations and he was going, all right, well, if we take someone's height and we, we take their weight, then we're going to calculate this magical BMI. And that was a hundred years ago. And now we're still using this thing called the BMI and it's supposedly meant to tell us something about someone's health when it does not do those things. You cannot arbitrarily take someone's height and weight, plug it into an algorithm and be like, oh, that defines your health. Health is waking up with energy and feeling like you're excited about the day. It's, you know, your blood results. It's how well you sleep. It's having enough headspace to think about things other than calories and reps at the gym. It's how easily you fall asleep at night. It's, it's how your mental health is going. Health cannot be measured by your your height and your weight. And yet yeah. it is something that is perpetuated, it is, it is wide widely spread and it's definitely going to be something that the medical community are going to grapple with how do they make the change and move away from it we are you know we assume that someone who is slim who you know they could be binge drinking and smoking and taking drugs and we assume they are healthier than someone in a larger body who could be exercising often and feel like they're in a really good headspace and eating a really nice balanced diet Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we have such prejudice around what someone weighs and we assume that we can guesstimate how healthy they are and we need to learn that that is complete rubbish and it's outdated. And you think you look at Olympians and their BMIs, you, know, <laughs> you get these rugby players who are you know, categorically obese and yet they're an incredibly healthy individual. Um, or once again, people who fall well within the healthy weight range on the, according to the BMI and we know they don't live a healthy life. So yeah. I I think we need to take the BMI with a pinch of salt. I think we need to, if our, if our healthcare professionals are talking about BMI and insisting that it's a very important metric, we maybe need to wonder if they are the best healthcare professional for us because there's a whole lot of emerging research around BMI and how useful or not useful it can be. Yeah. Um, there are case studies where I could see it being used, so I'm not going to throw baby out with bathwater but generally I'd say boycott it and we can move into measuring our health in a myriad of different ways and it's so crazy how what is considered healthy often seems to mirror what is considered desirable in a a sexual attraction kind of way and you know we go back a few more hundred years and women with those voluptuous you know bodies curvaceous bodies hips and and breasts were considered you know that that's that's what those paintings look like, right? That's sure. what was desired and beautiful. And now the uh, the body ideal is so warped that you're somehow simultaneously meant to have a really tiny waist and very low body fat percentage, but at the same time have boobs and a bum. It's miraculous and honestly very impossible for most people. We have mannequins that are so thin that even the smallest size clothes in our clothing shop needs to be pinned into place so that it can actually fit on the mannequin. And we think that, you know, these become our definitions of what's desirable, which then informs what we consider healthy to be. So I think it's a dangerous, slippery slope when we think about that. 
Um, and I think you've got to realise there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people like models who lose their periods because they're not at a healthy weight for them. And yet we're looking to them, you know, they're gracing the covers of our health magazines and still getting photoshopped and with all the lighting and all the, the fanjangled things. And I think we really need to question what's happening right now. As though that's the epitome of health. Mm-hmm. I can't help as we have this discussion be reminded of that. Oh, it makes me angry, Lindy, that horrible troll that you've, you've highlighted this comment where um, someone said, I think on, on an article of you, uh, I don't take nutrition advice from um, nutritionists, people who aren't in bikinis or something like that. Yes. Like, yes. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. And then they also commented that I had overgrown horse teeth and there was another comment about um, oh, I want to assassinate dietitians and oh it's really it's really fun being on the internet sometimes and you know funnily enough they were they were all comments from men I actually don't receive those kinds of critical comments about my body or my weight from women as much Mm. which I find is kind of an interesting thing to recognize but um the internet is not a fun place to be that's yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Still a lot needs to change. And that is mm. just one example. Um, tell me before I let you go, how has becoming a mum and going through pregnancy, has it shifted anything in your mindset or your understanding around food? Um, those kind of things as you sort of have gone through this transition in your life? Yeah, sure. I mean, it sure has. It's been a huge seismic shift in my life. I feel like firstly going through pregnancy was a very interesting experience because you have random people commenting on your body all the time, wanting Mm. to touch your body. Um, It really becomes this kind of other body and you're constantly growing and it's out of your control. And, you know, people will say things like you look huge. And I, I used to, I, you know, I used to have an eating disorder and I work in body image space, but even I wasn't immune to feeling doubtful about how my body looked. And my husband would remind me things like, you look exactly how how someone who's 35 weeks pregnant is meant to look. I think especially with pregnant women, we we don't actually see pregnant women, real pregnant women. One of my friends, she's a model um, and she's a 25-year-old, beautiful model. And she does pregnancy clothing shoots where they give her a fake tummy and then she does the shoot. And I, you know, see her as I'm browsing for these these pregnancy photos and I'm thinking this is part of what's making us feel like this is what a pregnant person's meant to look like she just has this perfect tiny bump she looks normal you know for what she normally looks like and beautiful elsewhere and then even you know think about our news presenters we don't see very pregnant women either they end up you know going on maternity leave um or you know hyper controlling what they eat so that they they're sticking with this perfect weight range so I think it's a triggering time and then you give birth and your body's completely different and you have no control and these crazy symptoms like you know after birth your boobs are like rock hard and then they're like leaking milk everywhere and you're having hot sweats and like there's new I've got a new c-section scar and you know weird things coming out of every single place so mm. it's a really interesting time very humbling time and you know I'm not about this idea of trying to get my body back my body is fundamentally changed and it's interesting I did get a few trolls who'd write you know this is why I don't want to have a baby because it destroys your body wow but I think that's quite a I think that's quite sad that we've kind of been taught that you know once a once a celebrity gives birth that they need to look you know back to their perfect selves very quickly it's now 14 months after my son was born I'm I'm feeling really good in my body but there was a time where I had multiple different clothing sizes in my cupboard and I just allowed myself to buy new clothes. I didn't think I had to fit into my pregnancy jeans too quickly. I popped them up on top of my shelf. I put them away and that was really important for my body image. Um, Yeah. 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 Putting it away, like putting away those clothes for the time being and just embracing a new wardrobe. Yeah. And giving yourself permission to get the new wardrobe because for a lot of people waking up and not having something to wear could be a huge trigger that drives you into dieting, which drives you into binge or emotional eating, which keeps you stuck hating your body even more. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that something as simple as dopamine dressing, which is the idea of getting dressed to make yourself feel awesome, is actually quite a powerful strategy to helping you feel better in your body. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Lindy, you're so damn raw and real. And I just appreciate you so much for being in this space 
I'm bringing all of this, like, it's just that refreshing dose of balance to this industry that everyone needs. And thank you so much for being a pioneer and a leader in that. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Oh, I love having you. Now, tell me, Lindy, for those who might not already be following you, where can we find you and learn more about everything that you do? Cool. So I'm called nude underscore nutritionist on Instagram. Um, Promise lots of just wholesome content there. (laughs) Uh, And lindycohen.com. But if you Google the nude nutritionist, you'll be able to find me. I've got a an app to help you be healthy without dieting and getting stuck in the nonsense. Plus I specialize in binge eating disorder. So I've got a program. If you struggle with emotional and binge eating, it's what I do. It's what I love helping people with. So I'd love to be able to help you. And I'm writing my next book right now. So that will be out in Jan, 2023. And I'm very excited. Oh my gosh. We'll have to have you back when that new book is out and ready to go. Oh, I'd love that. Yes, please. That's so exciting, Lindy. I'll have all that information in the show notes for everyone. Go check her out. Give her a follow. Thank you so much, Lindy. Thank you. If you're ready for the deep dive into this work to master your anxious mind, I invite you to join the Anxiety Reset Program. Over 90 days, I'll be guiding you on how to build your mental resilience, reprogram those limiting beliefs that keep you stuck in self-doubt, heal your gut, balance your hormones, nourish your mind, body, and soul. Using a combined approach of naturopathy, nutrition, hypnotherapy, and live group coaching with me, you'll feel supported and motivated to show up for yourself consistently day after day. And this is how you will experience extraordinary results. You can master your anxious mind. The best time to begin is right now. Let's do it together. You'll find the link to learn more in the show notes. Thank you for listening. We have reached the end of this episode. If you enjoy this podcast and you find it helpful, I would really appreciate it if you would hit subscribe or share this episode on your Instagram stories and make sure you tag at Georgie the naturopath. But that is all for today. Please be kind to yourselves. Know that you are enough and you are exactly where you need to be. Mm